The Barbados Sea Turtle Project rescues over 60,000 hatchlings every nesting season as part of its mission to restore local marine turtle populations to levels at which they can fulfill their ecological roles. In this episode of In the Know, Director of the Barbados Sea Turtle Project, Carla Daniel, lobbies for government to implement lighting legislation, shares what's needed from hoteliers along the coastline, and says more resources are needed for the Barbados Sea Turtle Project to continue their efforts in protecting this critically endangered species. I'm Crystal Hoyt, and this is In the Know. Carla, thanks for joining us. Let's jump right in. In recent times, we've seen incidents of turtles being attacked. What has been the response of the Barbados Sea Turtle Project? So we've had two turtles attacked recently. The most recent was early September when we found a turtle in a canal. We initially thought that the head injury the turtle sustained was a result of the fall. She was found in a cement canal, which was about seven feet deep, found on her back. Someone turned her over, but it was immediately apparent that she had a severe head injury. Her behavior was atypical and we knew from experience and from looking at her that she most likely would have to be put down. We called the vet. Our vet is Dr. Gus Reeder. He came down and within minutes of seeing the turtle, he was the one who told us that the wound to the head was not a result of the fall, that it was in fact a cutlass lash. So she was chopped to the top of the head and he said that the cut damaged her brain. So she was then given what essentially was a lethal injection and she was put down at that point. So she was not tagged. So quite possibly she had returned to Barbados in 2023 to nest for the very first time and was killed before she was able to complete her nesting season. Prior to that, we had an incident which was perhaps even more brutal. This was down at the hot pot. And in this case, a turtle came up to nest. Two men uh, that were hanging out in close vicinity saw it. One of them picked up a piece of wood. Both men approached the turtle and then they proceeded to beat the turtle over the head with this piece of wood. Now, I don't, I want to underscore how violent this was. This man approached the turtle, he hit it with the piece of wood. The wood flew out of his hand, that's how hard he hit it the first time. The animal was in shock, it froze, and then she turned, tried to go back to the sea, he picked back up the wood and proceeded to hit it another five to six times. After that, they grabbed the turtle by the back flippers, dragged it to the back of the beach, and then walked back over to where they were sitting previously and sat down as though nothing had happened. What protections are in place for sea turtles here on island? Are there consequences for those that mistreat turtles? So sea turtles are covered under the Fisheries Act, which is cap, I believe, 391. And the regulations for that act state that it is illegal to um, disturb turtle nests, etc., kill turtles, and so on. There is a $50,000 fine and up to two years imprisonment. So if you are caught either, you know, disturbing a nest, taking turtle eggs, um, killing turtles, etc. you can face up to two years in prison or be fined up to $50,000. Legislation is one thing, enforcement is another. Is enforcement an issue? I would say enforcement is an issue because turtles are nesting on the beach. They're vulnerable on the beach. Police patrols don't typically include the beach at night. Uh, we do have the Marine Police, and I have to say that they are extremely responsive whenever we have any incidents with turtles. They responded to both of those incidents. In the latter case, the most recent one, they actually went down into the canal, got the turtle out of the canal, and they transported the, the animal to the veterinary services for us, or well, with us. So they have been exceedingly helpful, uh, but police patrols on beaches are are not frequent. So the problem is, is that in order to get enough evidence to convict somebody, you have to have, you know, a whole set of circumstances kind of overlapping because you need to either catch them in the act, 
you need to have a witness. You need to have perhaps video footage or camera footage of them committing the crime, or you need to catch them in possession of turtle meat or turtle eggs or whatever. And those things are very, very difficult to get. I'm glad that you mentioned turtle meat because 30 years ago, turtles were no different to flying fish or dolphin. Now we've moved from eating turtles to protecting them. So, wind the clock back a little bit. In the 1980s, 1970s, there was an open season on sea turtles in Barbados. You could go to a fish market and persons would catch turtles at sea and bring them to shore and they would butcher them and you could go buy turtle by the pound in the same way that you could buy dolphin by the pound or you could buy flying fish, etc. In 1998, a moratorium was passed on the harvest of sea turtles because it was recognized, one, that sea turtles are more valuable alive than dead, two, that the population was severely threatened and it could not sustain a harvest. And three, um, that it was exceedingly valuable biodiversity. Um, so we have gone from the point of eating turtles to turtles being an attraction, essentially. Bajans love to see turtles when they go, for example, on the South Coast Boardwalk. Um, tourists, I would dare you to look at any tourist advertisement and not see some form of turtle included. Even if you look at our hotels on the island and you look at their advertising, their logos and branding, a lot of them include turtles. When you go and look at Barbados merchandise or souvenirs in the shops, I would say over 50% of the merchandise includes some turtle imagery. So the tourism industry has recognized the value of sea turtles to Barbados. There's also that uh, swim with the turtles tour, which does have its negatives, but one of the things that it does is that it raises significant amounts of money for both the large players, so the catamaran owners, but also the persons who are taking glass bottom boats out and small boats in Carlisle Bay, uh, dive shops as well. Uh, persons benefit from their guests being able to dive and see turtles foraging on the reef. People love to go swimming in Carlisle Bay and just encountering turtles as they swim along. I've had somebody tell me up to recently that they just happened to go out on Brighton swimming and they, there were three turtles there feeding. So the turtle population in Barbados is one where you are able to encounter turtle. Yes, there are those paid tours, but you can encounter turtles organically if you just go swimming or snorkeling on almost any beach on the south or west coast of the island. Recognizing the economic value that the sea turtle population brings, do you think that enough is being done to protect them? No, I will say it quite bluntly. We are definitely not doing enough to protect our turtles. They are, and is, there's an overwhelming number of threats to sea turtles in Barbados. Some of them are, are huge threats where we really can't do a lot. Climate change, of course, is a factor. Um, sea level rise, erosion of the coastline, all of those are things that are difficult to combat. But there are other things like lighting legislation, which over the last three decades, we've tried very, very hard uh, to get implemented. But you know, there's, there's been no gift there. What's the importance of implementing lighting legislation? You know how Superman has kryptonite and he is like this superhero, he can fly, he's super strong, he's lifting cars, he's doing all of these amazing things. And then you bring this small green stone and all of a sudden he is completely vulnerable and able to be killed and all of that kind of stuff. Light for sea turtles is their kryptonite both for the adult turtles and for the hatchlings. So they are extremely sensitive to light. When a turtle comes up onto a beach to nest, sometimes what happens is that after they nest, they need to find their way back to the water. When that beach is brightly lit, they can become confused about where the sea is. And instead of turning and going back to the sea, they then go inland towards the property. We've had turtles killed like this because they have gotten off the beach and then seen street lights and thought that that was the sea and gone straight for the street lights, gotten into the road and been struck by vehicles. We've also had nesting females come up, lay their eggs, and instead of crawling the scant few meters back to the water, they go towards the properties. We've had to fish them out of swimming pools. We've had to fish them out of uh, trees in some instances and just in restaurants and in general construction sites and a variety of properties. Now the other big thing is that light can deter turtles from nesting. 
So there's some places that are very brightly lit and the National Index Beach, which runs from Needham's Point to the beginning of the South Coast Boardwalk, is one of those areas that we've studied. And we have looked for correlations between the amount of lighting in certain areas on the beach and the amount of sea turtle activity that we have in those areas. And what we found is that there's a very strong negative correlation. All that means is that where it's very brightly lit, you have very few nests or very few turtle activities. And where it is darker, and not saying pitch black, where it is darker, you have way more turtle nesting and turtle activities. And why this becomes critically important is because sea turtles are losing their nesting habitat. Now, turtles need to come onto land to lay their eggs. There's nothing else they can do. They cannot reproduce at sea. Without beaches to lay their eggs on, the population will crash. They cannot survive. The west coast of Barbados is in pretty bad straight basically lots of the beaches are gone a lot of beaches that when i started working with the sea turtle project i recall patrolling you no longer can walk past you either have the waters up to your waist there's lots of boulders lots of rocks etc and those beaches are essentially gone and i've seen that happen on about four stretches of west coast beach so far so the west coast is essentially disappearing a lot of the beaches which are currently wide and stable are also currently developed and they have extremely bright light. Now I do want to be clear that when we speak about lighting we are not saying that we should have no lights on the beach because of sea turtles. Uh, persons often link a low light or no light to increased crime for example and when we mention uh, turtle friendly lighting, the first thing they say is, you know, the security needs and so on of the project. Now, the thing is that sea turtle friendly lighting is simply long wavelength light. All it means is that one, you are using the appropriate type of light for your needs. So let's say you want, there's a step and people are tripping on the step. So you need to illuminate the step so they don't trip. You could put a bollard or a short light at the corner of the step to illuminate it so people can see. What others might do is put a 50 watt light up in the coconut tree that not only illuminates the step but it illuminates 30 meters in every direction around the step. So often we over light areas, often uh, we don't direct the light appropriately so we want to maybe light an entryway and we will put the light on the third floor of the property at the roof lane instead of putting it at the roof lane of the first floor. So because the light is so high, it spreads much, much further. So we actually have properties on the West Coast, for example, Jordan Supermarket is one. They have security lighting on their roof lane. They're not on the beach, but we have hatchlings that are disoriented on a nearby beach because of the security lights at Jordan Supermarket. And it's because of the height of the light and the fact that there's nothing screening that light from the beach. So sea turtle friendly light is still aesthetically pleasing, it still looks good. In fact, it's softer on the eyes because those long wavelengths of light are amber color to red. So it's like a nice fireside color, which is much, much softer and less harsh. And then there's simple things that you can do like putting for, on some of their security lights, motion sensors, so that they're still triggered when persons come too close, but turtles wouldn't trigger them. So it's not, they're not on constantly. What turtle friendly light is as well, is it's money conscious. When you have appropriate lighting, when you use longer wavelength light, you use less electricity and you save, quite frankly, you can save quite a bit of money. So when persons are doing their landscape lighting, when they are lighting their properties, especially these very tall seven and eight story hotels that we have coming to our coastline soon, uh, you can save a lot of money in the running of your operations by installing turtle friendly lights. Not only are you saving money, but you are helping critically endangered biodiversity as well. Now I didn't mention, which is really important. So lighting is a huge problem for nesting turtles, but the biggest problem is hatching sea turtles. So when turtles come onto the beach and they lay their eggs, they're laying about an average of 150 eggs. These eggs are staying in the sand for two months. When those baby turtles come out, it will take them up to five days to dig from the bottom of the nest to the top. When they get close to the top of the sand, they go to sleep and when it cools down, which is typically at night, they wiggle their way and they come up and come onto the surface. When they get to the surface, they lift their heads up and they physically look all around and they go in the direction that is brightest. Now this is a brilliant strategy because these baby turtles need to get to the sea as quickly as possible. They have to avoid predators. They have to avoid all kinds of dangers. So on a, 
undeveloped island or um, a stretch of land that has no hotels, restaurants, etc., the water is always brighter than the land. Even on nights when there is no moon, the water is still brighter than the land. So when those baby turtles come up and they look around, they will head straight for the sea. Now, places which are developed, which is about 95% of Barbados, we have lights all along the coastline. What that means is that they are going towards the properties instead of going towards the sea. This causes endless problems. Now, the very first problem is an invisible one, and this is one that most people are not aware of. When a baby turtle comes up, it has a little ball of yolk in its stomach that is its energy source. It's kind of like a battery. Once it's using this yolk, it does not have to eat. So all the energy, it uses up about half of it to dig its way out of the nest, and the other half is supposed to get it to the sea, and then it swims out to sea, right out into the open ocean, and finds shelter. Baby turtles are vulnerable to everything. Any fish that has a mouth large enough will eat them. Any bird that sees them will eat them. They are soft. I'm assuming they're tasty because everything loves to eat them. So if they hang around in the near shore, they're gone. That's it. They're not gonna last long. They have, there's no mummy out there waiting for them to swim out and protecting them with her flippers. No, they're on their own. From the time the eggs are laid, that's it. There's, those strings are cut and they have to survive on their own. So when they get out to sea, they need to swim out to the deep ocean, find sargassum, and that sargassum provides shelter, it provides a bit of camouflage, and then sargassum is an entire ecosystem in and of itself. You have sargassum fish, all kinds of uh, juvenile crustaceans and larval fish and everything. So there's a lot of food for a little growing sea turtle. So they will stay with that sargassum for four to five years. No, this is where it gets tricky. The survival, this is, we're thinking, you know, completely natural, everything going as it should. Survival is one in a thousand. So one out of every thousand baby turtles that get to the sea safely will survive the 25 to 30 years to adulthood. Now, our problem in Barbados is getting that thousand hatchlings to the sea safely. Outside of lighting issues, what are some of the factors that contribute to hatchlings inability to get to the sea safely? We have a huge rat problem on the Richard Haynes boardwalk, like to the point where about two weeks ago, a nest hatched and I had to stand up over the hatchlings with a piece of wood, hitting at rats to stop them from snatching up the baby turtles while somebody ran to get a bucket so that we could collect them. We had another instance a couple days before that where we saw a couple hatchlings, we ran to get them. By the time we got onto the beach to look for where the others were, every single hatchling that we found was bitten by a rat. And rats are like hyenas, they go for high value organs. So they go for like kidneys, lungs, intestines. So they are biting holes into the hatchlings and eating their organs. And they're not dying immediately. They're dying very, very horrible deaths. With some of them, they hold them down and they bite into the top of their heads and they go for the brains. So there's rats, mongoose. Mongoose are such a huge, huge problem. The person that told the farmers, the plantation owners, that they could bring in mongoose to eat all the rats and save their sugarcane. If I could see him now, I would like to have a stern talking with him because mongoose are the bane of my existence. They are so smart. I mean, they really are amazing animals, but I wish they were in India where they belonged and not in the Caribbean. So mongoose find turtle nests and they dig down and they will eat every single egg in a turtle nest. They find them because they smell the female when she comes up to lay, but they also smell the baby turtles when they're hatching. So they pull out these premature baby turtles out of the nest, rip them out of the eggs, and they eat off the yolk from their stomach, from the still developing hatchling stomachs, leave them on the surface, and then then we find them sometimes alive with a little hole in their belly because the yolk has been eaten off. And then sometimes they'll come back and finish them off. We have mongoose problems at Bath in St. John, Maycox in St. Lucie, and all the way from Spike Stone on the West Coast down to Whole Town. And there's some beaches where almost every single nest is lost because of mongoose. Crabs are also a problem. And if you thought rats, oh my gosh, that rat predation sounds so horrible, crabs are worse. You know, like, Edward scissors hand, scissors hands or something. You know, there's a movie where this guy has scissors hands. Crabs have like players' hands. I remember they don't have any teeth. 
So if they're gonna eat something, they need to pull it apart. So they grab, they use one of their little players, they grab the hatchling, usually by the neck, and then they take their other little players, and the hatchling's alive, struggling, and they just rip off pieces of its face, usually. Face, neck, wherever, and they're there holding it. Rip, it's like a buffet, ripping off pieces, and they're just eating it. Chooping hatchlings, they, oh my God. And they're like ripping off another piece and eating. It is the most gruesome thing until the hatchling bleeds out and dies. Now, crabs are natural predators, fine. Technically, I guess you could say rats are natural predators. Mongoose are here, so they're predators as well. The problem is not necessarily the predation. With mongoose, yes, we want, mongoose are invasive, we want the mongoose gone. But with the crabs and the rats, the big problem is that because the hatchlings are going towards the light, they're going towards the crabs and they're going towards the rats. And so it comes back to lighting along the coastline. Carla, let's stick a pin there. But when we return, we're talking about what hoteliers need to do. Stay with us. Carla, you've raised a number of concerns from rats to mongoose to lighting. What else do you think needs to be addressed? So there are a couple of things that we need to do better in Barbados. I'm going to start with the lowest hanging fruit. One of our big issues is safe spaces for turtles to nest. One of the things that makes the beach unsafe is beach chairs. And there are many of the hotels along our coast that leave their beach chairs on the beach 24 hours a day. They simply do not stack them. And these are some of the same hotels who, when they want to do beach works and they have town hall meetings, they say, we want to put these boulders in because we're going to make more nesting space or we're going to create a more stable beach for turtles to nest. And they get permission, they make a beach, and then they cover every inch of that beach with beach chairs and prevent the same turtles that they were touting when they were trying to obtain permission from even accessing the space that they've created. And that is something that is exceedingly common. I think, honestly, it should be legislated. It should be illegal for hotels to leave their chairs out. If your tourists want to get up at 2.30 in the morning and lay down on the beach, you can leave a small set of chairs handy that they can just take one and go sit down and use. But I walk the beaches, our patrols at night are from 7 p.m. to 4.30 a.m. I walk the beaches all during the night and I can tell you that your guests are not up at three o'clock in the morning lounging on beach chairs. There are people lounging on your beach chairs, but they're not people who are staying at your hotel. And from a Barbados Sea Turtle Project perspective, there is also the issue of resources. Tell me about that. <sighs> resources. Resources is a bad word. So the Barbados Sea Turtle Project is funded by grants and donations. And I told somebody up to last night that we are very, very used, as the old people would say, to making a dollar stretch. So we have an amazing group of volunteers and we do have supporters that help us to keep going. What we are desperately in need of right now is transportation. So we have um, currently two vehicles. One is about 22 years old and is sadly showing her age and the other one is I think 11 years or older at this point and both of these vehicles are having some issues. So recently we had severe mechanical problems with both vehicles and they were both down and for the first time in as long as I can remember we had to close the Sea Turtle hotline. So we were unable to answer emergency calls, we were unable to offer any services because we had no transportation. And this went on for a number of days. We actually have one vehicle right now. These vehicles are critical to our operations. We get, last night, the volunteers had 23 unique calls between the West Coast and the South Coast. What I'm hearing is that more resources are needed so that you and your volunteers can continue this important work mitigating the threats to Barbados' sea turtle population. We're going to stand in the gap to ensure that sea turtles are not lost from Barbados. These additional stresses, these additional threats, these turtles that people are chopping and beating to death, these turtles that are falling over canals and falling over people's walls and breaking their necks, these turtles that are being hit by cars, thousands of turtles that are coming inland, baby turtles that are coming inland and dying, and not getting to the sea. All of those are helping to make the problem worse. We cannot control what's happening to hawks, those out at sea, whether they're eating plastic, whether they're dying in 
ghost gear, whether they're being, being caught by fisheries, whether it's pollution or disease or whatever it is, we cannot control that. But what is 100% within our control is what happens here on our island. And we are not doing enough. Lots to think about. Carla, thank you for making the time. No problem. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us.